In June of this year, I asked ChatGPT to come up with five of the most beautiful, challenging, inventive, valuable, provocative, and or foolish questions about rule breaker investing. It did. And I gave my best shots at answering them on that week's podcast five months ago. And so was born a new episodic series for the Rule Breaker Investing Podcast. Well, this week's volume two picks up right, but this is now. Now late in our ninth year, Games, 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 volume six will kick off the first week of December. We'll go over my favorite tabletop board games of this year in time for the holiday gift giving. And then our besties, 2024. What were my 10 favorite podcasts welcoming back guest stars galore for the second week of December? Of course, the Market Cap Game Show after that, and then our final mailbag episode of the year. Before I kicked off this episodic series, ChatGPT Asks David Answers, I decided to ask ChatGPT what it knew about this podcast. That's something for those who don't prompt ChatGPT regularly or don't know you can do, you can. You can always just say, at the top of any thread with ChatGPT, please summarize what you know about me, or please summarize what you know about this. And of course, if we're going to do a podcast where ChatGPT on the podcast asks me questions about this podcast, it's probably helpful just to make sure we were aligned. So I said, tell me six things about the Rule Breaker Investing Podcast. And this is what ChatGPT said back before giving me the five prompts for this So a quick summary of this podcast in six points. Point number one, it said the podcast emphasizes unconventional investing strategies that aim to make people smarter, happier, and richer. It encourages investing in top performing companies with strong growth potential. That was number one. Number two, educational focus. David provides valuable lessons on investing habits, traits to look for in stocks, principles for building a portfolio. Number three, engagement with listeners. Monthly mailbag episodes address listener questions, enhancing engagement, and providing personalized advice. Number four, ChatGPT said guest features. The podcast frequently features authors, experts, and thought leaders offering diverse perspectives and insights. And five and six go like this. Number five, humor and storytelling. David incorporates humor, historical references, and storytelling, making complex financial concepts more accessible and enjoyable. And finally, number six, Conscious capitalism. There's a strong focus on conscious capitalism advocating for businesses that positively impact society and operate with a long term perspective. And quote, and I said back to Chat GPT, thank you very much. That that is a very good summary indeed of what this podcast is about and stands for and aims to deliver every week. So knowing now that we were aligned, I decided let's spruce up volume two. So what I've asked ChatGPT to do is throw me five questions, just like last time, except this time using a baseball vernacular. One of my favorite metaphors, of course, for investing is baseball. It's really an ongoing allegory, an extended metaphor. So we're going to be rocking each of these questions as a pitch, baseball fans. And I realize not everybody's a baseball fan, so I'll briefly explain what I mean by each of these pitches as we get into the podcast. So I have asked ChatGPT to give me its very best shot in the form of a hardball, a softball, a curveball, a screwball, and we'll close with a knuckleball. Without further ado, let's get started. All right, question number one, the hardball. I said to ChatGPT, this is probably maybe a follow-up from last episode. If you feel I didn't effectively address that initial question in the first place, or or if you think there's more richness to discover by asking me a hardball question, forcing me to go deeper, do it. Hardball. And here we go. And I quote, with technology rapidly advancing, we're seeing more disruptive innovation than ever before. In volume one, you mentioned maintaining a long-term perspective amidst accelerating technology, especially in fields like AI and biotech. Here's the hardball. How do you distinguish between truly transformative companies that will stand the test of time versus those that are simply innovative but may ultimately fizzle? In your view, what characteristics separate genuine rule breaker companies from ones that seem promising but end up being short lived hype stocks? Well, let me first appreciate the question. I especially appreciated right at the start. ChatGPT pointing out that more disruptive innovation is happening now than ever 
before. And by the way, that is great news. It is great news for rule breaker investors that innovation is spreading like wildfire. It's a little bit disconcerting sometimes when a lot of the things we grew up with or expect begin to change. All of a sudden, AI is making some decisions, for example, driving a portion of this podcast this week, or robots may be taking over some of the things that people once did. And that's going to continue proliferating into the future. But for rule breaker investors, that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for companies providing better products and services, replacing the older ones with something better. And through the miracle of the stock market, we can be part owners of the companies that do that. And we're going to beat the stock market and most of Wall Street by buying in earlier and holding well past the very short-term timeframes that most people trade in when they talk about the stock market. So that is an essence of rule breaker investing. And yes, chat, GPT, it starts with more disruptive innovation than ever before. So the question though, about distinguishing between truly transformative companies versus the ones that may ultimately fizzle. And I think I start my answer with a nod to rule breaker stock trait number one. I first wrote about it in our book, Rule Breakers, Rule Makers, dated 1998. So I hope you'll take some solace or even interest in noting, dear listener, that here we are 26 years later, and I'm still talking about the exact same trait, having used it over the last few decades to pick stocks, often for Motley Fool members. And the first trait of the rule breaker stock is we're looking for a top dog and first mover in an important emerging industry. Of the six stock traits we look for in rule breaker stocks, that is the first one. I put it first because it's the most important. And I've often said in the past, and I say it again here, that if you just focused all of your stock market investing on that pond, if you just pick up your fishing rod and only fish in that stocked pond, you're only looking for companies that are top dogs and first movers in important emerging industries, you are in a much better place than most investors, and you will very likely outperform most investors by focusing on these kinds of companies. And so, when does it go wrong? Which are the ones that that fizzle out? versus the truly transformative ones. And I was thinking about this from three angles. You know, I wrote 26 years ago in the book, I use the phrase, I don't use it that much in the podcast anymore, but it's a great one, faker breakers. Stocks that look like rule breakers, companies that look and smell like rule breakers, but they end up not really being rule breakers. So we call them faker breakers. And I have a few different types that I want to go over in answering this provocative hardball question. The first one are companies that are not really top dogs. Like they're in important emerging industries, but the fake or breaker, the fizzle out thing going on with them is they're not they might be first movers, they're not top dogs. So let me give a few examples. Blackberry. Blackberry was certainly an early mover in smartphones. It was dominant for a good portion of time, but ultimately it didn't end up the top dog, even if it was the first mover, because it didn't keep innovating when Apple showed up with its iPhone and Google showed up with its Android, and all of a sudden the world proliferated with smartphones, and yet BlackBerry was still clinging to that physical keyboard, which had been so effective for it for years on its phone. And iPhones and Android phones just dispense with it all together. And that was a good example of BlackBerry failing to continue to innovate and no longer being the top dog and first mover, even though it was in an important emerging industry. So BlackBerry, a couple more examples come to mind. How about MySpace? Facebook came along shortly after MySpace launched. MySpace was the social network. It was all by its lonesome in the pole position, first place in social media early on. But Facebook showed up with a better user experience, some better features, and especially Facebook iterated more rapidly than the people did over at MySpace. And as a consequence, MySpace is just a page in a chapter of investing in business history at this point. And Facebook meta platforms is today the obvious Rule Breaker, which has been a fantastic Rule Breaker stock for Rule Breaker members for more than a decade now. So MySpace is another example of a company that in an important emerging industry, it didn't stay as top dog. It didn't keep moving. 
A third one comes to mind. This is a stock pick of mine that didn't work out, unfortunately. It was a 10-bagger at one point, and we eventually sold at a loss, and that's 3D Systems, the 3D printing company, which had a lot of hype behind it, including some of my own, a lot of belief from a lot of people that this could be a transformative company. But 3D Systems, which still exists today, it's just much smaller and less ambitious, I would say it was really challenged at scaling. In fact, widespread adoption, which I was hoping for, for 3D printing still really hasn't shown up, especially at the consumer level where a lot of 3D systems business was focused. Certainly, there are 3D printed houses today. There are 3D printed industrial parts. It is a substantial and important technology, but 3D systems in that important emerging industry did not really establish itself beyond first movement as a top dog. So in answering this hardball question, doing a deep dive with you as we answer ChatGPT's question, I think of the three categories I can think of for faker breakers, the first one to summarize are companies that just didn't establish or keep top dog status, albeit in a dynamic industry. BlackBerry, MySpace, 3D Systems. Now let's do the flip of that. So category two of faker breakers are companies that were top dogs and they were first movers, but as it turned out, they didn't end up in important emerging industries. Their industries or their products were emerging, but what at first appeared to be brand new industries ended up not really being so. And so these companies fizzled out. And I've got three more quick examples of this one. Let's start with GoPro and action cameras. Fantastic product, made a big splash when it appeared. It started looking like it could be a media company with its own TV channel. But in the end, GoPro action cameras were really more of a of a feature than a standalone industry. So this is a good example of a company that made a splash. I picked it for Motley Fool Rule Breakers. In fact, I picked all three of these stocks for Motley Fool Rule Breakers, but they ended up not being the industries I hoped they would be. The second one that comes to mind is Fitbit. Wearable fitness, certainly an important technology. Fitbit, an early mover and a rule breaker stock pick. But I think what happened is that smartphones showed up and began to copy some of the features of the wearable fitness trends. And the Apple Watch showed up as well. And all of a sudden, we're similarly tracking our activities and movements. We just don't need a dedicated Fitbit for that purpose. So Fitbit ended up fizzling out as well. And there's a third example that comes to mind. And again, I regret to say another stock pick of mine for Motley Fool Rule Breakers, and that would be Pandora. Pandora, which I continue to use to this day, it was really the first personalized music streaming service. Thumb up the one you like, thumb down the one you don't like. You, you're not really sure what's going to show up next as the channel creates itself with your help over the course of time. And I have dozens of Pandora channels, but I think what a lot of us have noticed since then is Spotify showed up and Apple Music showed up. On-demand listening showed up, what Pandora didn't really provide. And eventually, Pandora just acquired as a small company by Sirius XM. Again, still exists today, but GoPro, Fitbit, and Pandora were all early, I would say TiVo as well, were all early flash companies that were doing something really interesting, but they did not, in the end, end up being a leader in an important industry. They were really more of a feature than an industry, and each of them kind of fizzled. So I hope this deep dive chat GPT and dear listener into the rule breakers that didn't work out because they were faker breakers and the recognition that some of them, again, faker breaker class one, the ones that were in important emerging industries. However, they didn't end up staying as top dogs. And the second class of faker breakers, the ones that were not, as it turns out, in important emerging industries. I think that gives a pretty good way of analyzing and viewing the ones that don't work out versus the ones that do. There is a third category. I'm going to call this group number three, and I'm just going to say that's the way the cookie crumbles. In other words, sometimes things just don't go your way, even if you do have a good top dog and first mover in an important emerging industry. There are extraneous factors that come into play and matter. There's no single factor that you can ever look at and say, these stocks will win and these won't because they all fulfill this trait that we've talked about here over the last few minutes versus the ones that don't. So I would just say companies like Nokia or Yahoo 
or Kodak. These are all companies that for a long time were big winners. And yet, ultimately, I would say to, to group them together, they didn't really keep up with innovation. Thinking about Nokia, it, it certainly didn't respond to innovation. It ended up selling its phone business to Microsoft. Yahoo, Yahoo actually tried to acquire Google early on and missed that opportunity. Eventually, Yahoo was sold to Verizon and Kodak. Uh, maybe the saddest example of all, for decades, a great American company based in Rochester, New York, bringing photography cheaply to the masses, Kodak pioneered digital photography technology, but ultimately it didn't want to cannibalize its film business. All of those got to get your pictures developed people slowed down Kodak from responding to companies that came in and began to break its rules. And eventually Kodak ended up in bankruptcy. So this third group of faker breakers are companies that really were real rule breakers for an extended period of time, but in general, didn't keep up with innovation. So in answer to your question, ChatGPT, distinguish between the truly transformative ones and the ones that fizzle. I hope this was an adequate response. Let's move on to something a little easier and quicker. In fact, pitch number two is a softball. And for those who are not big baseball fans, well, after a hard ball, you often appreciate a softball. I asked ChatGPT to serve me up an easy question for me to answer with particular emphasis, perhaps, on speaking to new listeners. And here is question number two. If you had to sum up rule breaker investing in a single sentence, what would it be? And I thought about this one and I decided without prolonging my answer too much, I didn't want to just do one sentence. I came up with five sentences, but each of them could stand alone as an answer to this question, but they come at it from different angles, which I think makes for a slightly more interesting podcast. So if I had to summarize rule breaker investing in a single sentence, here's a few ways I might do it. Here's the first. Everyone is an investor and everyone can make a 100 bagger. Speaking to that briefly, sometimes I've asked people to raise your hand in a room full of, maybe I'm giving a talk at a conference, raise your hand if you're an investor. And it's a trick question because everybody should be raising his or her hand. Everyone should be raising their hand because we're all investors, even if it's just the time that you're investing in things or the money that you spent on this when you could have spent it on that. We're all constantly making investments and waking up to that, switching on to that and realizing that as an investor, you probably should commit to your future self to save, to save some money today, invest it today to benefit from the shade of the tree that grows that you grew tomorrow. And that by the way, Everyone can make what to many people seems preposterously difficult. Everyone can make a 100 bagger, a stock that goes up 100 or more times in value. I've already done it seven times historically for Motley Fool members. Any one of which of those stocks can make you financially free. And anybody who paid us $100 or more for Motley Fool Stock Advisor has seen that a number of times. It's very possible. It's very doable. I want the whole world to know that. That's what we've been trying to do at The Motley Fool. And for me in this podcast for nine plus years now is to recognize that that is indeed not just possible, but very doable if you go about things the right way, like a rule breaker. So there's a sentence. Here's a different one. The joy of investment gains is potentially infinite times the pain of loss. The value of winning completely wipes out the cost of losing. Humans are hardwired to resist loss at three times the rate that we enjoy gain. That's just biological for all of us. But here's the amazing thing about investing. The worst you can ever do is lose 100% of your money. And even with bad stocks like GoPro or Pandora, I've still never quite done that. But the best you can do isn't just 100% higher balancing out your 100% loser. Nope. The best you can do, well, every one of those 100 baggers has gone up 10,000% or more. The joy of investment is exactly opposite our human biological hardwiring. The value of winning completely wipes out the cost of your losing. I've seen it in my own portfolio over decades. So many of our members, you all write me in, mailbag, 
reconfirming, confirming and reconfirming this truth. Most people don't know it, and that's breaking the rules in a single sentence. Here are a few more. Buy high and try not to sell. That's one of my favorite sentences because it counteracts what a lot of people hear, buy low, sell high. I say in response, buy high and try not to sell. I won't belabor that point or explain it further. I often talk to it on this podcast. Buy high and try not to sell. Here's another way to summarize rule breaker investing in a single sentence. Throw good money after good. In other words, when you have extra savings, your next salary check every two weeks, when you've saved up money to invest and you want to add to an existing stock, add to the ones that have gone up, not the ones that have gone down. Again, this is something I speak to on a regular basis, so I won't belabor the point here. But if you're trying to summarize rule breaker investing in a single sentence, that's not a bad one either. The last one I'll give is I try to find excellence, buy excellence, and add to excellence over time. I sell mediocrity. That's how I invest. Now, admittedly, that's kind of a run on sentence, but it really does summarize so much of what I've tried to put out there, not just for 10 years on this podcast, but for 30 plus years through The Motley Fool. I try to find excellence buy excellence and add to excellence over time. I hope you will too. We sell mediocrity. That's how we invest. Now, before I end the softball response, let me say I decided why not? I'll ask ChatGPT back since it's gotten to know this podcast well over the last nine years. ChatGPT, if you were summarizing rule breaker investing in a single sentence, answer your own question. And here's what it said back to close question number two. It said, Rule breaker investing is about finding, investing in, and holding the boldest, most innovative companies of our time, guided by habits, traits, and principles that embrace disruption, defy conventional wisdom, and harness the power of optimism to build lasting wealth. That's not a bad sentence. A little bit long, but that's not a bad sentence to summarize rule breaker investing either. Thanks for the softball. Let's move on to question number three. All right. Well, question number three is a curveball. So I said to ChatGPT, throw me a curve. Surprise me. Maybe with a beautiful question or or maybe you perceive that I've got a blind spot. Point it out. It's time for a curveball. And here is its very best shot back for this week's podcast. Are there any specific signs or changes that would make you reconsider holding even a top rule breaker stock that's been a long-term winner? Really appreciate that question. And I guess I spoke to this a little bit earlier when we looked at some of the faker breakers, and at least one or two of those companies may come back up here as I think to answer this curveball question about specific signs or changes that would make me reconsider holding this from somebody who says, invest for at least three years, if not three decades. So the only way most of us ever get to a 100 bagger, which all of us can, and I hope will, is that you have to hold stocks for a long period of time. That means you have to hold stocks through some really bad periods for the companies themselves as they make inevitable missteps and or through really bad periods for the stock market itself. Once every 10 years or so, the market usually implodes for one unpredictable reason or another. And the only way you're going to get your 100 baggers is holding through all of those moments and then some. So I think it's really worth pointing that out in the first place that, of course, I celebrate and underline holding as much as anybody I know. And yet the question is, curveball, what specific signs or changes might we identify and stop holding something. So when when I think of one of our first grade stock picks at The Motley Fool, this one put us on the cover of Fortune magazine in the summer of 1996. It was just a stock pick. It was just one pick in our portfolio, but it had been the top performing stock on NASDAQ for two consecutive years. It had a lot of hype behind it. Again, just one of our stock picks. It was called iOmega. And some of you will remember, older hands will remember iOmega as a company that was providing a storage solution, its zip drive, which in an era before, well before the cloud, and when hard drives themselves were expensive and were just sort of stuck inside the box of 
your computer, all of a sudden the zip drive was portable, which was nice, and it held a lot more megabytes than most other competing storage solutions on the market. iOmega was on fire for lots of different reasons, and it's not like I sold it at the top. I rarely do for any of my rule breaker stocks. iOmega was a fine investment overall, but we definitely let it go well on its way down. And ultimately, I think a specific sign or change to Chad GPT's question about this company, I would say it had a single product dependence. Now, iOmega did have other products, but really it was the zip drive in a changing technology world where, of course, computer storage would keep getting better and better. This small cap company was very dependent, invested so much in that brand and that product. And it was a great product. I loved my zip drive back in the day, but it didn't really continue to evolve or innovate rapidly enough. And the world kept changing and left iOmega not for dead, but on the roadside ailing. And so iOmega stock ended up being a good investment for the Motley Fool and members, but certainly not a great one unless some of us, not me, timed their way out of it at the peak. So single product dependence is something worth scrutinizing. Another great early stock for us years ago at the Motley Fool. This was my first 100 bagger, although I don't count it anymore as a 100 bagger because it didn't stay above a 100 bagger return. America Online, ticker symbol AOL. AOL went up at its peak 150 times in value for me and Motley Fool fans who followed us online back in the day. And yet, of course, post that Time Warner merger in 2000, lost a lot.
As always, people on this program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. Learn more about Rule Breaker Investing at rbi.fool.com.